My name is Charles Els and I am a clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry and I am appointed as a physician educator in the Division of Preventive Medicine, Department of Medicine at the University of Alberta. This session focuses on the occupational impact of personality disorders. Thank you to the Workers' Compensation Board of Alberta for making funding available for this project. There are no conflicts of interest to declare. The opinions expressed in this presentation reflect those of the speaker and not necessarily those of any collaborator or project sponsor. This session provides a brief overview of the features of personality disorders, including a description of each, the prevalence, diagnosis, treatment and prognosis. And it addresses the occupational impact that being uh, at work on occupational capacity, risk and tolerance. At the end of the session, participants will be equipped to recognize personality disorders as a relatively common and occupationally relevant psychiatric conditions, describe the impact on capacity tolerance and risk, and thirdly, broadly outline evidence-based interventions to achieve maximum medical improvement. What is a personality disorder? Well, a personality disorder is an enduring pattern of inner experience and behavior that deviates markedly from the expectations of the individual's culture. It is pervasive and inflexible, has an onset in adolescence or early adulthood, is stable over time, and leads to distress or impairment. What are the different kinds of personality disorders? Well, the following personality disorders are included in the DSM-5 chapter on the topic. Paranoid personality disorder, and that reflects a pattern of distrust and suspiciousness such that others' motives are interpreted as malevolent. Schizoid personality disorder is a pattern of detachment from social relationships and a restricted range of emotional expression. Schizotypal personality disorder, that is a pattern of acute discomfort in close relationships cognitive or perceptual distortions, and eccentricities of behavior. Antisocial personality disorder is a pattern of disregard for and violation of the rights of others. Borderline personality disorder is a pattern of instability in interpersonal relationships, self-image and affect, as well as marked impulsivity. Histrionic personality disorder reflects a pattern of excessive emotionality and attention-seeking. Narcissistic personality disorder reflects a pattern of grandiosity, the need for admiration, and a lack of empathy. Avoidant personality disorder is a pattern of social inhibition, feelings of inadequacy, and hypersensitivity to negative evaluation. Dependent personality disorder is a pattern of submissive and clinging behavior related to an excessive need to be taken care of. Then, obsessive compulsive personality disorder is a pattern of preoccupation with orderliness, perfectionism, and control. There's another category called personality change due to another medical condition, and this refers to persistent personality disturbances that is judged to be due to the direct physiological effects of a medical condition, for example, frontal lobe lesions. What causes personality disorders? Well, the disorders are diverse, and the exact causes are unknown. The biopsychosocial model applies where predisposing factors, precipitating and modulating, modulating factors are applicable, and certainly genetics interacting with the environment play a central role. The prevalence of personality disorders vary widely and it depends on the clinical setting. For example, borderline personality disorder in the general population is estimated to occur at a prevalence rate of 1.6 to almost 6%, while the rates in clinical settings is higher, up to 1 in 5. Personality disorders can co-occur with each other as well as with other psychiatric disorders, for example, depression, substance use disorders, eating disorders, and several others. On this slide, you can see the estimated prevalence rates for each of the different clusters, as well as the different sub-personality disorders, as reflected in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM. 
The diagnosis of a personality disorder is best ruled out in a longitudinal fashion. Psychological testing is key in establishing the diagnosis. And this would include tests like the MMPI, the PAI, and those are used to confirm the presence or the likelihood of a personality disorder. The testing augments the clinical history and physical exam, which is usually non-contributory, but it is conducted to rule out medical problems that may be causing or contributing to symptoms that may mimic the particular personality disorder. The diagnosis of personality disorder is a clinical diagnosis using the DSM criteria with no definitive medical diagnostic test other than the mentioned psychological testing that allows for a diagnosis to be made with a reasonable degree of certainty. Looking at the impact on the ability to work, risk, capacity and tolerance. Although in most cases persons with personality disorders are considered responsible for their own behavior and are expected to perform and behave in a fashion at work that is both safe and predictable, uh, these individuals may certainly suffer from disabling symptoms. If unable to do so, they are generally deemed not fit for safety-sensitive work and hence not eligible for safety-sensitive positions. The personality disorder features have to be in remission in order to be eligible and, and fit for safety-sensitive work. For cluster A personality disorders, capacity is typically unaffect, unaffected by this disorder. Those who display cognitive distortions or perceptual distortions or eccentricities of behavior, uh, interpersonal functioning may directly and indirectly impact both capacity and the risk. In less severe cases, usually capacity remains intact. For OCPD, capacity, although typically unaffected, may become an issue and persons with more severe uh, uh, obsessive compulsive type personalities may be more prone to making more mistakes at work. And they also engage in the repetitive behaviors and time consuming rituals. This can impact safety, hence may result in restrictions in safety sensitive as well as decision critical positions. Borderline personality disorder. Capacity is usually not affected by the disorder unless it is more severe. Uh, as long as safety issues are adequately addressed, these individuals can possibly work in safety sensitive settings provided the symptoms are in remission. The problematic symptoms in this condition would include anger, impulsivity, chronic suicidality. These may become problematic at work. And if substance abuse and depression are comorbid in this condition, which happens frequently, occupational capacity and risk may be adversely impacted. Individuals taking medications to control their symptoms may require periodic drug testing to ensure that substance abuse and addiction uh, are no longer or are not concerns. Tolerance may be an issue with the diagnosis, mainly as a result of disruptions in interpersonal relationships, as well as the sensitivity to rejection inherent to borderline personality disorder. Safety sensitive and decision critical jobs are typically not indicated unless remission is achieved. Narcissistic personality disorder, capacity and tolerance are usually unaffected by this disorder and in some individuals they may even function above average. Tolerance may become a concern if interpersonal relationships are severely troubled and only in the most severe cases will there be a medical basis for restrictions. Antisocial personality disorder. These persons may be more prone to accidents at work and that may impact occupational risk. Problematic symptoms in this condition include impulsivity, forcefulness, aggression, irritability, and certainly interpersonal conflict. Capacity typically not affected, but the issue of substance abuse is a salient challenge as the prevalence of substance abuse is vastly elevated in persons with antisocial personality disorder. In this condition, tolerance is typically not a concern and the propensity for engaging in illegal behavior may prevent job duties requiring financial dealings or security or positions of trust, again for more severe cases. For the other personality disorders, capacity and risk are usually unaffected 
uh, and in all cases disabling symptoms may occur depending on the severity of the uh, particular disorder. For all personality disorders and the impact on occupational variables, comorbid mental disorders as well as substance abuse need to be independently assessed as to the potential impact on capacity and the risk. For the treatment, uh, for cluster A, due to the nature of the symptoms, it's difficult to engage these individuals. And individual therapy, although recommended, is often challenging. When doing individual therapy, limiting confrontation uh, is indicated. That may elicit swift process, uh, protest and rejection from the patient, often ending up in termination of therapy. Also beneficial may be CBT and, if they're able to tolerate it, group therapy. Medication has little other role to play in this class of disorders, but atypical antipsychotics used in an off-label fashion has been shown to have some benefit. There has to be a high degree of flexibility in therapy and the therapeutic approach, and if other disorders, for example, depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, substance use disorders are present, these have to be treated independently. Uh, and in those cases, individuals may benefit from standard antidepressants or anxiolytics. Antisocial personality disorder treatment. These individuals rarely seek help. When they do present for care, it's often for the presence of a comorbid condition, for example, depression. Uh, usually a risk assessment is indicated to ensure there's no risk of harm to others at work or even to the individual, him or herself, or to the therapist. Although CBT and social learning theories are applied in therapy for this group, there appears to be a renewed interest in psychodynamic dynamic therapy. Family therapy, milieu therapy, CBT are generally considered useful, and there's no consistent evidence that pharmacotherapy is useful in this particular target population to treat symptoms uh, uh, associated with ASPD. Comorbid conditions, for example, depression, anxiety disorder, substance use disorder, warrant independent attention. And treatments then focused on the comorbidity as opposed to primary symptoms like impulsivity, aggression, and anger. Treatment of ASPD usually tests the clinician's skills and patients, and a focus should fall on enduring safety for both the patient, the clinician, as well as co-workers. Borderline personality disorder, multimodal therapy is indicated, and the key modality here is dialectical behavioral therapy, or DBT, also, mentalization-based treatment, transference-focused psychotherapy, and systems training for emotional predictability and problem-solving have been proven useful. Family therapy and group therapy also indicated as well. Medication has an adjunctive role to play in the treatment of BPD, and mood stabilizers and antidepressants do have significant utility. Not all symptoms respond to medication, and for some individuals, antipsychotics are needed to target impulsivity and behavioral problems. Benzodiazepines should preferably be avoided uh, in light of the abuse potential, and in all cases, uh, comorbidity needs to be addressed, for example, substance use disorders. Histrionic personality disorder. Individual psychodynamic psychotherapy and psychoanalytical approaches have been used with benefit, as have cognitive therapies. There's no single medication that's indicated for the core features, but comorbid conditions should be handled on own merit. For narcissistic PD, individual psychodynamic psychotherapy and psychoanalytical approaches have been used with benefit in this case, as have metacognitive interpersonal therapy other cognitive therapies like CBT as well as DBT. Pharmacotherapy may be beneficial for comorbid conditions like MDD, anxiety, substance use issues. And there's no single medication that's indicated for the core features of this condition. And comorbid conditions are, of course, handled on own merit. For cluster C personality disorders, individual psychotherapy, specifically CBT, is usually indicated and attrition should be a focus of attention in this cluster. Supportive and interpersonal therapy may be of benefit, and if they're able to tolerate it, group therapy as well as family therapy. With the right level of care, maximum medical improvement is expected at 15 months of treatment or less, 
An MFI is estimated under the assumption that all aspects involved in the psychiatric diagnosis, namely the personality disorder, as well as comorbid conditions, have been taken into consideration. The prognosis for personality disorders vary greatly. It depends on the type of disorder, and cluster C is more likely to recover from full criterion status than cluster A and B. The prognosis for change in an individual who may not recognize a problem is poor, and in general the prognosis for PDs in the absence of ongoing treatment tends to be guarded. Personality disorders are common in the workplace, and the impact can vary from minimal to severe disruption of operations and occupational risk, depending on the severity of the disorder. It warrants ongoing attention and longitudinal management, predominantly managed in a performance fashion, while accommodating concurrent conditions like depression and substance abuse. For further information and uh, uh, additional topics, uh, please visit the website of the division. We look forward to your feedback and comments. Please help us identify further topics for future discussion. Thank you.